looking at beautiful Milwaukee, Wisconsin, the home of the 2022 College Championships Division I. We got UBC Thunderbirds in dark on offense against Carlton Syzygy in white. Theo Wan here with Ian Toner. Ian, this is going to be an exciting matchup. Can't wait for it. Theo, it's great to be here. A pivotal matchup for Pool C. Carlton hasn't taken the field yet at these collegiate championships. UBC already with a 15-5 win over Virginia under its belt. UBC now having the distance center of the field. Kurohashi finds her teammate there on the far sideline. Hong goes up the line. And there it is for the T-Birds. They get a score right away. That's sophomore Mika Kurohashi with the score. And UBC draws first blood, gets a hold. Well, Madison Ong attacking the upline space with that assist up the line to Kurohashi. Ong, one of the more talented and experienced players on this roster. Some TC experience with the U20 squad in 2018, the U24 squad in 2019, Beach Worlds on that roster for 2022. Of course, that tournament got canceled. But you can see her experience on display early for this T-Birds offense. This T-Birds team having a lot of players who play for the club team, Vancouver Traffic, as well as a couple from Red Flag and on the other side here, Carleton College not to be outdone. They got their own stars. And this matchup is very interesting, Ian, because these two teams have split the season series. That's right. They met twice at Northwest Challenge. Each team getting the better of the other once. And the last loss on Carleton Syzygy's season schedule came March 27th, 15-13 to UBC at Northwest Challenge. That's some great specific reporting right there, Ian. And that allows us to also know what Carlton's been up to the rest of the season here. As Caitlin Neer, one of the stars of this squad, going to get things started. To Carly Campana, and you know you're going to hear that name a bunch in this contest. Lanier airing it out. And that throw too far for Becky Shapiro and UBC gets a break opportunity. Well, it looked like Becky had cut off her deep cut and was kind of pivoting and angling to change direction by the time the throw went up. And a break opportunity here for the T-Birds. And knocked away by Campana will give Carlton another opportunity. Number three ranked player on Ulti World's player rankings, and you see why right there with the block, saving it for the offense for Carlton. Close to the break side here. Looking for options. Great dump defense there by the T-Birds. Lauren Holtz. Syzygy. Chin with a couple fakes. Finds Lanier in the backfield. Syzygy settling into their vertical stack here to the far side for Campana. She's going to lay one out there for her teammate. Forster with the grab. The senior ties it up as UBC not able to capitalize on that break opportunity. Well, Bree Forster, one of multiple players on this Syzygy squad with a soccer background. So you can see the speed and the field awareness coming into play there. And talking to coaches, Courtney Kiesau and Logan Weiss before this tournament. They mentioned that Forster's really grown to be more of an offensive threat, even though in their deployment and distribution, she tends to be more of a D-line cutter. Her ability on the turn or when she's subbed into that O-line cutter role has just grown and really become a bigger part of her game and a bigger weapon for this Syzygy squad to use. Something I, I think is worth noting as well, Ian, is how they deploy some of these players, both offensive and defensively. Will some offensive players cross over? When will that take place? Of course, very early in this matchup, but 
if things go to seed, this matchup is potentially for Pool C. So all the stakes are here. And it's a real challenge for a game of that magnitude with these consequences to be Carlton's first game of the tournament. UBC has had the benefit of getting some reps under their belt. Kurohashi snags the laser flick, flips it in for the score, and UBC showing some smooth offense right now, makes it 2-1. Well, the UBC receiver was all alone. Mika Kurohashi completely unmarked downfield, and that was an easy decision for Anna Gadu to pull the trigger. And then a nice finish into the end zone to Jessica Liu. Do you like some of the, the players on the sidelines here rocking the shades? It's not that sunny out here, and it's a little bit windy actually. And that may play a factor. It's played a factor in some games earlier that we've streamed here on Ulti World. And so we'll see if that becomes a factor again. Yeah, we've noticed the wind. We've noticed the wind becoming a a key variable in, in many of these matchups. There are times when it's been a stiff crosswind that's forced swings into the turf. There are times when it's been a stiff upwind downwind that's made it particularly difficult for downfield hucks to stay in bounds. There are times when the wind has, has felt like it's kind of died in the middle of a point as well. So if anything, it's been an inconsistent and, and mischievous presence here at the E-Line Soccer Park. It'll be interesting to see if that continues throughout this tournament as Lanier has it in Carlton's vertical stack look. And thought there was a safety release valve there and instead it's a turnover. And now UBC on the attack once again. Denise Sue getting there to get the block and directing traffic after the turnover. So we're trying to look for a teammate that kind of spun around there. Huang couldn't get there and I'm not sure where that throw was ending up, but either way, Carlton's gonna take advantage and have another offensive opportunity. Chin centers it back to the middle of the field. Kishner looks off at downfield and resets to the dump. Now going long for Campana. She did a, a great job going deep against the UBC in their first matchup at Northwest Challenge. You see it right there. And a little reset to Chin. Nice little offhand backhand there. And Lanier having to really stretch out for that throw and put some edge on it and it goes into the turf. So UBC, this is another chance for the squad. A clear out play to get things going. The two cutters closest to the sideline streaking deep and opening space for that third cutter to come across horizontally. And a little too far for Chong will result in a turnover for the Thunderbirds and Lanier, who's going to do a lot of the heavy lifting for Syzygy, to pick up. Earhart finds Lanier up the line. And she'll launch a flick into the air for Campana. A couple T-Birds in the area, but Campana with the lefty grab. That's going to be an interesting thing to watch out for if they can contain her in the skies. But there is potentially a call there. Looking at observer Linda Kudo. See our camera operator out there as well, getting involved, trying to catch some of the action. I because I ran into her, but she was on me. And I would have I would have had something on it if I didn't, like, didn't get picked. Okay. Yeah. All right. It's coming back. Pick. Coming back. Was there a count? So this deep shot here from Lanier to Campana, it looks like British Columbia defender Grace Huang 
was claiming that she got picked, and that prevented her ability to make a play on the disc. So the disc is going to come back to Lanier. Smart lane poach there, just flashing the lane from the T-Birds defender, taking away that first underneath option. Well, around now, two Carlton players in the area and might have been some miscommunication on who's going to take it. And either so it wasn't pretty. It took a couple attempts. But Carlton Syzygy able to hold. As we see the replay here, everyone thought Campana was in on that one, but took one more throw to Kishner. to preserve the hold for Carlton Syzygy. Also love the resolve of, of players like Kishner who you know, had a play where could have had the disc, didn't get it, play some defense, get another chance on offense here, and then you're able to deliver. So good to see from Kishner and the rest of this Carlton Syzygy squad as we get another look at UBC's offensive line. That last point specifically not being that tested We'll see what happens on this one. Human Weber to pull for Syzygy. Launching a huge backhand that is actually going to go out of bounds. As UBC settles into what's looking like a horizontal set. And that's... As a coach, sometimes those out-of-bounds pulls are tough to stomach, even in a windy situation, sometimes especially in a windy situation. You don't want to give the offense any kind of free or advantageous field position. At worst, if you're going to have trouble getting depth, maybe just aim a little shorter and try and roll something out the side, even if you got to sacrifice some yardage. Of course. Our hindsight's 2020 up here in the booth. That's why they're down there, bounce. Ian, and we're up here, right? So. Yes, sir. And the throw just gets right into the hands of Hurtabus. And Carlton going to take advantage. Going to go deep right away. Spinning around and almost making the grab. Leap high. Finds Yang, and Yang's going to air it out. Beeman Weber says, no way, and knocks it down. So Seattle was the play call. And a great grab under pressure. So player is down and... Seeing all the players kneel down as well and checking out the, the status of uh, the down Carlton Syzygy player there. Take a look at that block right there from Beeman Weber. And then just this last play here getting tangled up. Right now, we're going to take a quick break here in this stream. But UBC and Carlton tied up 2 all. We'll be right back.
Multi Worlds live streaming coverage of the college championships is presented in part by AGW Ultimate, who wants to remind you to say no to Big Ultimate. You can find them at AGWUltimate.com. We're back here, Pool C action, UBC, Carlton, Syzygy. Carlton just airing out a huck that kind of IO'd in, out of bounds to the right side there, Madison Ong to pick up. So, Ian, take a look at Carlton's defensive look here. Not something I've seen, at least for the first couple points. Definitely taking advantage of the positioning here and deploying a zone that tries to take away the near field four side options. We're getting a little further and further away from the initial trap. Kurohashi unmarked. He's gonna catch it with a couple of T-Birds in chase here. As Carlton now settles into their defense. And UBC gets another score. Kurohashi being involved in all three of them. UBC up 3-2. So quite the turn of events there for Carlton. We had Tory Gray shooting deep, coming out of the injury timeout, and there was a little bit of a miscommunication because the only true possible receiver in the area was that UBC defender, Jessica Liu. And then UBC rises to the challenge and marches the entire field quite patiently, I might add, and punches it in, and the T-Birds have an early 3-2 lead. You're seeing Kurohashi talk to the squad. Just a sophomore there, lots of time left for UBC and being involved in all of the scores in one way, shape, or form. As UBC ready to deploy their defensive line out there. UBC perfect on offense, two for two so far, and it's defensive unit one for three. The only break of the game, and that's the margin right now. Chin, no defender in sight. He's gonna pump a backhand out more, trying to help out in this matchup. And Campagna with the grab. Are you kidding me? Getting up large right there for Carleton College. Syzygy ties it up. Well, the UBC defender, Andrea Moyer, was the help defender on that assignment, peeling off the stack after Campana was in isolation and had a step on her matchup. And as you take a look at this positioning, Moyer is there first, but it's Campana who's able to high point it despite the pressure from Moyer, and Moyer known all season long for her fantastic defensive play. This is just a battle of some of the best of the best at their positions. Moyer, a fantastic downfield defender. Campana, a true force on offense, a huge downfield receiver. I don't wanna say bailing out Emma Chin, but really rising to the moment and securing the hold for the CCG offense. Looks like they got it on camera too there. Pretty exciting stuff, but Ian, Emichin being unmarked there, just allowing the, being allowed to just throw up a back end or any throw that, that she wanted. And, and that's so difficult to see as a coach. I'm not sure if there was a slight defensive breakdown, but especially when you have slightly challenging, windy conditions, you don't want to let an unmarked thrower perfectly calibrate something in challenging conditions, at least put some kind of mark on there so that you can amplify that defensive pressure and amplify that throwing difficulty in concert with the wind conditions. Kurohashi now on this close sideline throwing. There it is. That gets blocked. There it is, Carlton. the crosswind, just deciding to show up once again after dying down between points. Variable is the right word, Ian, that you mentioned earlier. That is clearly true right now.
Gill on this close sideline trying to march this Carlton offense to a break. And as I say that, a low throw results in a drop. Um, fakes the backhand. Was underneath the leap high. Good height matchup against Beeman Weber. She then gets a reset, gets knocked away. Ada Wright coming through with the block. Or up the line, cut. I tell you what, that's one of the more challenging blocks to get. When you're a step or multiple steps behind and your receiver is attacking the upline space, making up that ground is so difficult to do. Airing it out for Syzygy and can't get there a block. But there is a foul call, Liu, in the area. Gale, the freshman out there as well. Second time this half, we've seen Tori Gray, the speedster, shoot deep for Carlton Syzygy as we see the conversation continuing between Clara Gale and Jessica Liu. Take a look one more time at that shot, Ian. I, oof. On that replay, that looks clean to me. I, of course, the the observer not quite agreeing with that one. We're, we're going to have a foul. And is that a disc don't lie situation right there as UBC gets the disc back after Carlton was on the doorstep? I yeah, don't want to provide any commentators curses or things like that out there, Ian. But right now, UBC does have the disc back. Along with another backhand fake. Gonna settle for Gadu underneath. And a high throw. Sails out of bounds just over the head of Jessica Liu. So Carlton College, Syzygy, another opportunity. And again, that was just like the last turnover we saw from UBC, except instead of initiating from the center of the field, it was from this sideline, but still trying to throw to that right-handed flick sideline. The crosswind in that situation has been so difficult for throwers to deal with. Looking for a break and just too far for Gale. So this point, Ian, a little bit grindier. Some The wind being the variable that you had talked about. Madison Ong, the experienced captain marching the disc up for UBC. Both teams have both of their timeouts left. We'll see if either team opts to use one soon as we see yet another turnover on this point. Gale spinning around and, and gonna be credited with the block there. Ian, what's the sort of the mindset for players when they are in such a grindy point like this and, and there's been a few turnovers? At this point, <laughs> it's so difficult to stay focused. Ong oh, coming from the handler space, trying to go deep, and it's caught on the second attempt. Gadu looking for a reset, finds one. Kurohashi finds Ong for the score. So not the way. This, you, you've heard this probably before, but not the way they drew it up. You're, you're exactly right. But UBC gets it done, and that's all you care about if you're a T-Birds fan in the audience. Turnover after turnover, foul call after foul call. And UBC back here at the National Championships for their 15th appearance taking a 4-3 lead here in the first half. Their second game of the day and Carlton's first 
here at the 2022 College Championships. And that's always a discussion, Ian, in terms of how teams have their schedule. You know, coaches say don't worry too much about the schedule, but when you look at UBC having a game already, they did have a bye before this. They got their legs under them, able to maybe try some new looks, winning handily 15-5. Carlton, on the other hand, not having that opportunity, does that hinder them at all or maybe keep them fresh for this game? I, I can see arguments for, for both sides. Um, at the end of the day, the Nationals tournament format is a little more forgiving than your typical Northwest Challenge or something like that when you're squeezing eight to ten games into two days or something like that. Ideally, if you're only playing two games a day for two days and over the course of three and depending on how far you can make it, ideally you've got the legs with that decreased workload spread out over a longer duration. And that allows your, your big players to also play those, those minutes when you need it. As Carlton now on offense, Kishner holding the disc. And working to that side, and Moyer with the block. UBC gonna punch for it right away. Just outside the end zone of another break. Little dump swing action, and UBC gets it. Their second break of the game. And they gotta be fired up right now, Ian. Well, that, bro well, that block and that break Brought to you and sponsored by Andrea Moyer. Her speed on full display, just blowing up that underneath cut and then wasting no time after earning the block. It's time to turn on the afterburners. Off to the races after the turnover. Reels in the deep shot. Doesn't panic on the goal line. Finds the reset. And once you find that easy, patient reset option, the next throw is that much easier. And, you know, the British Columbia coaching staff and, and leadership was just raving about Moyer's progression and improvement throughout this season. How every single time the stakes have risen, every single tournament, she's made an even stronger impression on the defensive side of the disc. And she's living up to that reputation before our eyes here at day one of the college championships. Moyer out there once again for UBC as Carlton sending out a similar line here, their usual suspects. Kishner, Campana, Lanier, Chin, Earhart. Looking at that stat graphic right there, that's the tale of this, or the story of the game so far, Ian. Two breaks, two goal lead. Carlton's got to find a way to hold here and then get its defense back out there and see if its D-line can punch back. And here gets the reset from Campana. And a low throw there to the turf gives UBC a potential second straight break. Goes inside and it's hand blocked. And back and forth action, Campana just outside the end zone. Resets to Earhart. Now Carlton settling in to their end zone offense here with Lanier. Goes around, high throw. And it's knocked down by a Carlton player and then UBC kind of makes sure there's no damage after that. Well, oftentimes in Ultimate, you hear people spout the maxim conservation of greatness. And Kate Lanier is someone who kind of said, screw conservation of greatness, I'm just gonna do this myself. And she got the disc back for her offense by getting a phenomenal hand block. And then she threw a perfect huck out to space to Carly Campana but then Carlton just unable to convert in the red zone after that effort. 
and they've got the disc back after a gift turnover here. Error had some pressure, don't know if got a hand on it, and Moyer with the attempted block, but Carlton gets it. Had to make sure, and Syzygy does get the hold. Some back and forth action, Ian, it's, it's a lot. Theo, I was fooled by that one too. I saw Moyer leave her feet, and I thought for sure that was gonna be UBC's disc once again. But Carlton making the tough grabs through traffic, grinding it out. Again, these O points aren't the prettiest, but with the exception of those breaks, they're finding a way to respond. Allie Friedkin hauling in the score. And Carlton now, that is what they needed. You said it right at the start of the point there, Ian. Get the hold, get your defensive line out there to try to make some plays, putting the pressure back on UBC, and they did just that. See Logan Weiss out there giving instruction to his defensive unit, a 2011 national champion with the men's cut squad. Ian Courtney Kiesau coaching this team. Logan focusing a lot more on the defensive responsibilities. And I love that ritual there from the UBC O-line. I love O-lines that have some kind of ritual to get themselves focused. Whether it's a quick verbal cue, some kind of a huddle or a clap, just getting everyone in sync. It activates that muscle memory and sets the tone for the offense going into the next point. Split stack here from UBC and back to your point Ian, I couldn't agree more. I love that from offensive lines. Talked about it on the last broadcast, attempted block there. Able to get through was Liu. Great pressure though from Pampana, who's crossed over to this defensive line here for Syzygy. Unbelievable throw off the line there from Liu. Had to get extremely low and wide with her pivot past the outstretched mark of Carly Campana. Couple inside breaks for UBC, does the job. You did see there on that point, Ian, a couple offensive players crossing over. That's right. Carlton's coaching staff electing to try and load up the line just a little bit, but that offensive hold for UBC, as we see Carlton Syzygy taking a timeout here, that offensive hold for UBC that's the skill and the style of play that British Columbia is known for. That's gotten this team to the semifinals in the last couple years. A lot of capable throwing, a lot of great handler movement, attacking the front of the stack, attacking in those small spaces. That's not to say that they don't have the skill or the prowess to air it out or to stretch the field, but they're most known for attacking in that small handler space and you can see the institutional knowledge and expertise just flowing down to this next uh, next generation and on display here in Wisconsin. We're getting a look at the UBC huddle here and their coaching staff doing a great job getting their team ready. And Ian, gonna get you to put your coaching hat on. Uh-oh, that's not something I've done in a high pressure situation, but you know, I'll, I'll indulge you here. You'll indulge the audience with your answer. If you're UBC, what are you saying to your team right now? Carlton just calling a timeout. What are, you, what are you talking about to your squad? I think it really depends on the culture of the team. And I'm not trying to hedge too much. Is, it, is this team a team that thrives on being silly and goofy? Or is this a team that needs someone to lock you back in and instill discipline and lay out the focus for the next couple points. It's, it's, it's really dependent on how that team's culture and identity has developed over the course of the season. And that's not to say those are the only two options, but I do see things like that at opposite ends of a spectrum. Um, understanding this UBC squad the way I do, I feel like they can just keep things nice and loose. They're, they're executing mostly well. They've got an advantage. I don't think there's any need to emphasize five different strategic points. Just keep doing what you're doing. Focus on your matchups. I'll figure out some more cliches that I can that I can spit out, but I, I really think it's it's that you want to keep a huddle like that simple to keep the team just in flow and in rhythm. 
That's definitely a good point there, Ian. I'm sure you've been in some huddles like this or, or people in the audience where there's just too many instructions being laid out and too many focuses, and that can lead to some potential disastrous results on the field as players end up thinking too much, potentially. Ask our Ulti World colleague, Tina Booth, what she thinks about multiple instructions from multiple people in a huddle. That's a recipe for failure. And she knows that. She's been in more settings and been in more leadership situations than any of us here at Ulti World. I'll take her advice eight days a week. UBC after a block for Moyer. Has an opportunity and just a little too far. But I like the, the way that they're attacking here, trying to really put pressure on Syzygy right now as the sun's starting to come out a little bit here in Milwaukee. This is the first time we've seen the sun all day. Throw out in and out of Lanier's right hand. And now UBC trying to get a critical three-point lead here. Inside throw snacked on by Lanier. Makes up for that drop earlier. Kate Lanier's defensive game has been on point so far. Airing it out for Chin. And best, excuse me, Holzman coming down and getting the block. Looking deep. Unfortunately, not enough juice on it or float for Sue to run onto it. And Carlton, another reprieve potentially on this offensive point. Bono working on Tremblay here. Swings it back to Lanier and they get it to that far side to Earhart. Wants to reset back to Lanier. Carlton in that vertical stack look as Campana toes the line. A little high release flick action to Kishner will get it done. That O point is the encapsulation of an incredibly well coached team. Because, sure, they had to fight through a couple turnovers, but once that offense found its groove, it was perfectly content to use the width of the field to keep opening up its addi additional options and changing that angle of attack. As we see Campana doing a fantastic job towing the line. And I mean, there aren't many other players I'd give the green light for a high release inside flick with the window and the margin closing. But Carly's one of those throwers where I've got no problem with her pulling the trigger. She's been doing damage in the skies as you've seen in this game. And now with the throws, and that makes a lethal combination that UBC is going to have to stop. UBC's offensive line out there keeping the same personnel, which that same cheer as well. You can't see it on your screen there, but Ian, that's music to my ears. I just love seeing that. Helps those offenses find their rhythm and establish a sense of comfort and unity before the point starts. In my mind, it also just looks cool. A little <laughs> intimidation factor there, potentially. At, the, at its most basic level, it's pretty cool. I can't disagree with you. Lee Pai and Gadu gonna play a little give-go. Furuhashi going up line. And she'll get it for the score. Her third goal to go along with three assists. What a half for her. Great execution on that point as well by Anna Gadu, the 21-year-old junior captain from Seattle, Washington. Instrumental in that give and go that ate up a bunch of yardage. And then connecting with Kurahashi 
and it, I don't know, Theo, it's like we blinked and all of a sudden we're on the verge of halftime. Yeah, it's been hard to, to keep your breath with some of these uh, fast-paced action that we're seeing here on the highlight package. Just some great blocks and Kurohashi just doing it all right now for UBC. A burgeoning star in Canada and you're seeing why right now. Kurohashi rostered on Team Canada's U24 squad in 2019 and her the U20 squad in 2020. Be excited to see where her career takes her next and whatever squad she's trying out for next, putting together a hell of a resume reel here in the first half against Carlton. Yeah, and as you heard Ian say, U24s in 2019, she's currently 19. So that means she made it as a 16 year old, which is an amazing fact in and of itself. Sophomore from Burnaby, British Columbia. Get to know her, folks. Now it's Carlton's offense with a chance to respond. Don't want to go down half. 8-5, of course, and get your hold and, and try to nail some breaks in and make this half a close one. Your heart goes inside. Chin flips it to Kishner. And Kishner getting involved in three goals for Carlton. They get the hold they needed and now put out potentially a power D line. Well, great stack discipline there from the Carlton Syzygy offense. No one was veering too far from the center. And when you maintain that stack discipline, Yes, there are occasionally smart help defenders who know where and when to cheat or spy or take an extra look. But if you're disciplined and the assignments are staying close to their receivers, you're reducing the possibility of other traffic in the area getting the hand on the disc. And that finishing shot into the end zone by Kishner was only possible because of that stack discipline. There weren't other defenders clogging up that front of the stack area or bleeding off into that four side lane, just able to execute and finish with a clean throwing lane into the end zone. And as you say that, you know, I, I just think about also what you said before, which is the fact that they're well coached and that's players can learn that, but it's, it's through the coaching and, and the, the hours and hours of drills and drilling that stack and that discipline. 100% and you can have just as much of an impact on your team's offensive success by what you do away from the disc as you can with the disc. If you're making space for your teammates, holding space for your teammates, occupying a defender, you are opening up other options for your offense. Carlson, one of those legacy programs in college, also in both in the men's and women's division, and you're seeing why right now in tough against this UBC squad as Ung shakes free in a block now. Kurohashi gets denied. Well, I was waiting to see when Tori Gray was really going to put her mark on this game defensively. She was so instrumental in Carlton's run to the semifinals in December back in Northco, Norco, California. And she comes up with the block there and the first underneath in traffic for Syzygy. Now they're looking for a break themselves. Pompana grabs it with the left hand. Looking for a teammate. And there it is, some bookends for Tori Gray. A little spike from Syzygy as they tie things up. That was a big break for them, Ian. Could have gone down half, 8-5 at one point. Offense scored, and now they get the break. You called it, Theo. A heck of a swing, a huge swing, and you can feel the energy shifting between these two teams. Carlton gathering the momentum, and Tori Gray, we can't say enough about her execution and her potential. As you get a look at that stellar block, I mean, We've seen her do things like that on the national stage before, but her coach Logan Weiss says 
that she surprises him with some of the Ds that she's able to get, particularly in help situations. He, he mentioned, you know, he's seen her at practice and tournaments this year, and he's kind of walked away from the field thinking, I mean, I know you weren't the primary marker there, but I didn't think you had any shot at getting that. And, and Tori still comes up with some of those blocks. And right there, you just see her pursuing all the way to the break side and earning that block. When you're a coach too, Ian, and you see a sophomore making those plays, knowing that you have some more time left, that's got to oh fire goodness. you up and the program itself. You just got to be salivating, thinking about the potential of what that player can do for your defense and the rest of your squad in the years to come. Race two for UBC here, trying to get a hold and, and continue that lead. And as I say that, Campana gets another block. This one a little, little bit of the easier variety, just knocking it down in her pathway. Yeah, there were two options open, but the, the underneath inside break throw just off the mark and going right to the defender. Cadu against Campana, and Campana two hands. Strong in the air. And a popped up around throw, that win, you can hear it in the mics, playing some tricks as UBC calls a timeout, looking like a smart call right now as there, the two players discuss the stall count. Just when we thought the wind had died down, we felt the sun coming out, things starting to warm up. The clouds are back, the crosswind is here, and it forces another turnover. Love that timeout call though by Nancy Yang for British Columbia. This is a critical situation for the T-Birds. With this timeout, we're gonna look at the impact Carly Campana has made on this game. Saw the throw there, and just the amount of pressure she's putting on the defense, both in the backfield and then downfield as well. Four goals, excuse me, four assists to lead the way for Syzygy right now. Well, and you can see how great she's been as a downfield release valve, making tough grabs in traffic, whether it was that underneath or other deep shots. And she's got the ability to finish, cross over, play on both lines. I, I don't use this phrase lightly. Campana can do it all for Syzygy. It must be nice too for handler like Lanier Ian to have a safety valve if the stall count gets high, point and say, go there and I'll <laughs> lay it out for you and you'll go and grab it with two hands even. Oh man, it can be a cheat code at times, you know? Carlton coming out in a zone defense after this timeout taken by British Columbia. Along with a couple fakes trying to move the cup and they do have it in the middle of the field now. Do the freshman working with Madison Ong. Great mark here from Carlton trying to pin UBC on that far sideline. Holy Kurohashi cow. She snags it. That pass from Nancy Yang. Just right up the gut. Not only achieving progress horizontally, but also vertically. I mean, she had maybe one or two yards to spare horizontally, but she hit that throw right on the money. And look at that, another beautiful throw right off the line. And now it's just that cascade of flowing breaks as the Syzygy defense tries to recover into matchups. Uh, dude, going for Kurohashi, has to go backwards for the grab and throws another assist for the score. So UBC takes the lead, 8-7 into half. It's been an exciting one, Ian. Lots of highlights, lots to talk about as we set up the second half for our audience at home. Well, both the stars on both squads leaving their fingerprints all over the first half. As you see, Mika Kurahashi 
with that assist going into half. She's got four assists and three goals, accounting for seven of British Columbia's eight scores. On the other side for Carlton, Carly Campana, four assists and two goals involved of six of Carlton's seven scores. You know, it's nationals. It's called the show. It's called the big dance, whatever you want to call it, Ian. But the ballers, the players come out, the stars come out, and they're showing it right now. Pana reeling that in, even with defensive pressure. That's something that's definitely impressed me throughout this game, Ian. And Carlton's going to need a little bit more of that and some more Tory Gray in this matchup. Some more Tory Gray. I think British Columbia would love to see some more Andrea Moyer. We saw her turning on the Jets defensively once or twice. UBC has a lead here at half, 8-7 over Carlton Syzygy. What would it look like if a competitive sport didn't mean a choice between beauty and brutality, style and steel, between calling yourself out and clawing to stay in? What if there was a game that found balance? between spirit and sport, agony and elation, like a disc dancing on air. We now have evolved into a team sport of a game called Ultimate. It stands by itself in that it is like no other game. Between perfect passes and devastating drops, like the balance we so desperately needed, we had no choice but to create it ourselves. Long live grit and grace. Long live ultimate. There is a place where we are us at our best. A place where everyone is welcome. Regardless of age, shape, skin color, or anything else that tries to box people in. A place where we defy the odds, defy the naysayers, and even defy gravity. A place where it's accepted that success doesn't belong to the faint-hearted. It belongs to the brave to the determined. A place that knows grit, knows grace, knows bright lights, and knows empty bleachers. A place where we remember to laugh. Where we learn to trust, learn to high five strangers, and eventually even learn to fly. A place where character, community, and competition are all as balanced as a disc in flight. That place isn't in a stadium or on a field. That place is in the spirit of our players. Because we don't just play ultimate, we live ultimate. have seen a lot of positive change around a whole range of important issues and some things remain reassuringly unchanged like the spirit of our game ultimate is 50 years young and still a perfect circle of fair play athletic pursuit and camaraderie in fact ultimate was a social network before social networks even existed Respetamos nuestras diferencias and understand the value 
that they add. The revolution of the disc in flight continues to prove that there's nothing we can't achieve when we pull together. Long live ultimate. Larga vida ultimate. Long live ultimate. Back and forth battle between Mika Kurahashi accounting for seven of UBC's eight scores and Carly Campana accounting for six of Carlton's seven scores. UBC having a break advantage here going into the second half, but another element that we've... Yardage gain underneath off of the, the pole play that they set up for her as Chin does receive the reset, but looks like she was wide open due to a pick call. Pick was called, but it, it did look like those two reset defenders were opportunistically switching or looking like they were going to switch to take away the upfield reset option. Another call is going to bring the disc back here to Syzygy. So. Carlton starting on offense for this, this point here. So, in fact, game on serve as there is a drop. And UBC trying to take advantage. Have the lead here, 8-7. Inside throw finds nobody, and Lanier's going to scoop it up. And we're giving go with Campana. And that's going to be easy, does it, for Carlton as they tie it up 8 all. Carlton answering to start the second half. And once again, Campana and Lanier connecting Lanier in the right spot to earn the turnover and then giving and going with Campana to attack. That give and go action, very devastating, especially in the end zone and seeing it with two of Carlton's stars there. Just under 27 minutes until the soft cap, eight all the score. Don't know if we'll reach 15, so it'll be interesting to see what happens with all that. Of course, the uh, soft cap coming into effect here in the preliminary rounds. If we get deeper into the championship bracket. Carlton pulling again here, Beam and Weber to start for Syzygy. It's UBC trying to get that smooth hold here their offense out there for the first time here in this half. Long has been the quarterback of this offense and got things started and receives it again. Finds leap high. On the doorstep. And there it is for UBC looking pretty smooth for their first offensive opportunity here in this half. That's the exact adjective I'd use, Theo. That was a smooth, smooth hold. And that's the confidence instilling response that British Columbia wants to put out there. Taking a look from the aerial view here, Ian. UBC's movement. As they're able to find another score here. Big shout out to our Ulti World production team for making this happen. Ian, they make us sound good, and they make all the camera angles look good as well. It's all about uh, telling the right story of what's going on on the field, and whether it's our drone cam, our gimbal cam, any of our other awesome camera operators, 
They're bringing the stories into your living rooms. If you haven't already done so, please think about subscribing to Ulti World. These productions cannot materialize without support from the community. There's tons of planning and resources and effort that make all of this possible. Whether we're talking about live streams or tape delayed games, every single team here at the college championships is going to be recorded at least once. The word I would use for that, Ian, is unprecedented. That is just an insane amount of games for you. Subscribers can get those tape delay games as well. They're being edited on as we speak, as Carlton is trying to shred through the zone and working things out with Chin here as UBC settles into person defense. And you're going to be continue to be that linchpin here for Syzygy. Campana with the toes and gets the hold. It's Campana continuing to pile up the stats for Carlton. I'm not sure what the answer is to slow down Carly Campana. If, if I knew what it was, I'd probably be coaching some kind of program right now, but UBC's got to figure something else out. I, I, I don't know if it's asking some other defenders to be more keen to help opportunities or changing up matchups, but yes, British Columbia is continuing to trade, continuing to, for the most part, maintain at least a one goal advantage, but I, philosophically, you know Carly's going to get some of her buckets, right? find some ways to make those buckets more challenging or make those buckets come from other players, right? Even if that means leaving another another threat open. We've, we've established that Carly is going to, going to make you pay if she's got a chance to get a hand on the disc. Two goals, six assists, count that eight of the nine points for Carlton have been counted for by number 43. Nice little inside throw to Kurahashi, who was isolated in the horizontal stack set. Liu. They're just bouncing up and down on the mark, trying to make that throw difficult as they get it to the far side. Slicing backhand is going to get the job done for the Thunderbirds. That just opened things up for them. And you talked about buckets. They're a little basketball celebration for you. Well, once again, we commented on Carlton's ability to do this after multiple turns deep into an O point in the first half. But... British Columbia's offense, so handler driven, achieving success there because it used the width of the field. That slicing throw that you commented on, that throwing lane only opened up to connect with Avery Lee Pye because the rest of the offense was willing to swing the disc, use the entire width of the field. My favorite phrase, change the angle of attack the more you do that, the more you force the defense to reposition. And how about that? If, if that isn't the sign of a happy, unified team, if that isn't a window into their culture and their disposition and how comfortable they are in this moment, I don't know what is. You mentioned that earlier, Ina. I, I know you remember this, where you said, are they going to be a loosey-goosey or kind of get back down to business? But I think... Based on what you see, you can kind of get a glimpse into that team culture. Yeah, it, it's not necessarily fully loosey-goosey, but it's happy and comfortable and full of positive energy that, that just seems to be radiating from them. And, and talking to the Carlton coaches before this weekend, Logan and Courtney said, hey, this team is at its best when everyone's kind of silly and being a bunch of goobers. 
Chin looking deep and reeling it in is Carruthers Lisk, excuse me, Yamasaki Lisk for the score. And Carlton makes it look good there. It almost looked like some on the go ad hoc dominator movement to start the point. It may not have necessarily been the play call, but just quickly attacking and then power position there. Emma Chin pulling the trigger. And when we're talking about Carlton, we talk a lot about some of their star players, of course. But Emma Chin, one of the handlers for this team, has really been a rock for them during this game. Might not be piling on the stats, but you need someone like that that continues to facilitate and move things around for your offense. Great to see the offensive workload distributed there. Believe it or not, Carly Campana not involved in that score, but Chin and Carruthers Lisk taking care of business. We're in for an exciting finish is all we can say, folks, so make sure you stay tuned. Tell a friend about the broadcast. We got two going on side by side, two more being filmed at the same time. They'll be available for Ulti World subscribers, so lots of ultimate action for you on this Friday. Going around, Kadu, nice little grab there. Gonna throw out a flick and Tori Gray in the area. That's gonna come down with it. An exciting action for the Thunderbirds. Making your heart stop once or twice, but they get the hold. Not once, not twice. The third time was the charm for Emma Best. Going up for the grab in traffic. Couldn't get it on the first attempt. Then it looks like it was in her fingers for just a second. And then the third attempt, she's able to clap catch it. As we get a look at the deep shot here, Anna Gadu pulling the trigger off her hands, off her hands again, and then, oh, there she secures it. Into the end zone for Jessica Liu. Connection between two British Columbia natives. Emma from, from Vancouver and Jessica from Richmond. UBC having some out of town players, but definitely contrasted by Carlton, which draws from a lot of different places, especially that Seattle, Wisconsin, or excuse me, Seattle, Washington pipeline. Yeah, they've got such an allure for the program. It's, it's an established program. They've won a national championship. This is their 31st trip to nationals. Ultimate is a club that's supported and prioritized on the Carleton campus. And you know when you go to Carleton, if you have ambitions to play Ultimate, you're going to be playing with some of the best players in the country. Yes, of course, there are players who are new to the sport and do find their way onto the roster, but more often than not, the base skill and experience level is a lot higher than starting at a program that may just be recruiting rookies who don't even know how to throw. Looking for Kishner, and there it is. Campana does get back on the stat sheet there, Ian, and ties it up for Syzygy with the pass to Kishner. Well, Kishner's had a nose for the end zone this afternoon. Whether it's been stretching deep there or in the small space red zone finishing area, just timing her cut so well. And again, that was also possible because of the discipline of the Syzygy stack. She had the space to take off from midfield and wasn't pulling her defender through any traffic that would have led to an opportunity for a pick. There was just that much room for her to take off to the end zone. Four goals definitely gonna help your cause if you're a Carlton fan there. And now it's just gonna be who blinks first on offense, it feels like, Ian, as we head into these latter stages. 11-11, well, Carlton has not let once in this game. 
British Columbia has had multiple two goal advantages, but at this point, Carlton still chasing its first lead in the game. And the last game on this field, we saw Michigan lead for three quarters, 80% of the game. And then the Auburn men came back and scored the last couple goals of the game, taking their first lead at 13-12 and going on to win 14-12. If you're a UBC fan at home, you're hoping that doesn't happen. And as we say that, a throw too far for Liu and Carlton now a chance to break for the lead. Side stack here for the Carlton Syzygy D-line offense. Gray is out there, but so is Lanier. And finds the aforementioned Gray. Humphrey can't find options. Now finds Lanier in the reset space. And Lanier looking. There it is for the score. Carlton gets the break. You might have been prophesying something there, Ian. But Carlton does get the break. They get their first lead of the contest. It's now 12-11. Less than 15 minutes to the soft cap. Maybe we'll get to 15 here. Either way, it's going to be an exciting finish. Lauren Carruthers-Lisk. Absolutely fired up after that point. She was isolated to start after the D-line offense got its hands on the disc. And after a couple throws and a little bit of patience, she receives the deep shot from Kate Lanier, the quarterback and distributor who's been pulling the trigger all game long. And what a time for this Syzygy squad to take its first lead of the game. It definitely is. And if you're the T-Birds right now, this is the first real mental test of the tournament. You had a matchup that you were able to win comfortably, 15-5. Now your back's a little bit against the wall here. What are you going to do? How do you respond? This is, this is exactly the test. And frankly, I think in the first half, it felt to me like it, it, it took a little bit for the Syzygy squad to find its rhythm and be comfortable in the flow of the game. And I was worried about UBC having too big an advantage in that department because they'd had that earlier round, as we see a shot to the end zone here. And Best finds Lee Pai for the score. And so they answered the question that we had, they're able to respond right away. Yeah, and, and, and to finish that thought, Carlton found its footing, especially here in this second half. And after getting taking a body blow, taking a punch, UBC responds and steps back into the ring, and they're ready to go for the next round. I love the boxer analogy because it definitely is, feels like this in this contest. UBC getting an advantage, as you mentioned, multiple two-point leads. Now Carlton got their break back. Now they have the advantage on offense. What can UBC's defense produce here? Haven't seen a lot of crossover, Ian. We've seen Carlton do that, not UBC. Wonder when that time, that switch will be on here. Right, and, and that's a very deliberate decision by the coaching staff, right? Jamie Cott and Jennifer Kwok, they have faith and confidence in their depth. That's something that they've emphasized all season long and defensively something that they focus on they take a lot of pride in prioritizing their marks just as much as their downfield defense they believe that is the foundation of their defensive effort if if that thrower can't get the first look off or can't get a throw off that kind of breaks down the whole structure of the defense then that, that mark is doing its job, and that defensive unit is that much stronger. And as we see Carlton's offense get settled here, there's actually multiple crossovers on this point, so maybe they heard us in the booth or just were forward thinking and crossing over Kurahashi right now, as well as Gadu onto this point. And it, 
it looked like a zone to start, but and there are a few rovers in that second tier. But for the most part, we're starting to see these British Columbia defenders locking in on matchups. Just Chin causing chaos, will it? Chin had the grab there. You did say there was potential chaos in Campana. Rises up once again. We've said her name multiple, multiple times, and you see why. Campana was going deep and is now going to get a big gainer. Sees Kishner coming to the front cone, slashing across the field on Kurahashi. And Kurahashi going down a little bit after that play and want to make sure that she is okay there. But Carlton does get the score and goes up 13-12. We don't want to make light of any potential serious injury, but Ari Kishner is truly out there breaking ankles. I mean, that's just turning on the Jets and attacking the front cone with ferocity and ruthlessness. And we've seen her stretch the field with some mid-range and deep cuts. We've seen her cut across for break finishes. And now it's just a simple, I'm going to beat you to the fourth side cone and there's nothing you can do about it. Now on the flip side here, UBC gonna be, at least for this point without Kurohashi, a product of crossing over and then getting a little bit tangled up and feeling worse for wear. Gadu is back out on the offensive line for UBC. So we'll see what they can do now. As Kishner has been involved, you mentioned five goals. And look at the variety of ways that she's attacking in the end zone. It's an opportunistic slash to the break side. It's an aggressive cut to the four side cone. It's a well-timed stretch to the deep lane as British Columbia turns it over. Right now, if you're a Syzygy fan, you're looking for that dagger to go 14-12. I did say before, potentially wouldn't go to 15, and that's definitely not the case as teams have been scoring quickly on offense. We'll let it play out and see if we get to that cap as Gray gets blocked by Ong. A huge rejection. Ong now center of the field. Has Lee Pai shrieking deep. Instead settles for underneath throw. Potentially going every other here is Ong pointing out instruction for the cutters. And Best does squeak free, but a pick called downfield. You made note of this potential swing earlier, Theo. There was a moment where it could have been 8-5, and instead, you know, a couple sequences later, we found ourselves all tied up at sevens. This could have been 14-12. Will we see ourselves tied at 13 right here? Lee Pai right on the end zone. And stumbling down is Nancy Yang, and we'll see what the call is there. Had her defender beat to the to the cone there, but tripped up. Still coming on six. Uncontested. So it's coming in one. What, even if it was uh, off the throw? It was an uncontested defensive foul, so. All right. <laughs> Saying one. And that throw sails down, perhaps a product of the wind. And Carlton, like I said before, when they had this defensive opportunity, chance to put in the dagger. Right, needs some options. Finds Gray. Gray going to set out a hawk, but Gadu in the area. Leap high as well. Two of the taller UBC players. And they're going to combine for a D there. Maybe they'll get half one each. Tori Gray 0 for 2 on deep looks on this point. We know she's a speedster. We know she can pull the trigger as well. Yeah. 
And going to find Lee Pai. Ten yards away from a score and a tie game here. Pass with a big flick fake. Trying to get there was due and just so close. But those margins of errors, the difference between a win and loss as Carlton calls a timeout. Two goal line turnovers in as many possessions for British Columbia. It's been an exciting one, Ian. We're going to take a break quickly here as Carlton's up 13-12, taking a timeout. World's live streaming coverage of the college championships is presented in part by AGW Ultimate, who wants to remind you to say no to Big Ultimate. You can find them at agwultimate.com. Carlton on offense here. They're on their end zone side. You're watching the 2022 college championships. Ulti World's coverage, Theo Wan, Ian Toner. Ian, this has been a really exciting game for the fans at home. They got to be enjoying it. Yeah, UBC looked to be the group in control, especially for the majority of the first half. Carlton then found its footing, and here in the second half, taking its first lead of the game at 13 12. High throw taken down. UBC coming out in a zone look here off the timeout. I like the variety of look trying to stymie Carlton's offense. Best almost gets there, but Ada Wright takes the disc away and shakes the head saying, you aren't going to get there. I love the zone decision coming out of the timeout by the UBC coaching staff, putting its defense in an advantageous position. I throw and Duke just going to make sure, doing a little box out action. And looking like Madison Ong, the anchor for this team. You mentioned before multiple Team Canada appearances. Provides that veteran leadership for the squad, especially from that center handler position. She's been so steady and so disciplined for this squad. And goes around to Dew and all the way to the far side to Best. Just too far for Gadu and multiple turnovers on this point. Carlton with lots of opportunities. You mentioned Gray with a couple turnovers on Hux. We'll see if they, if the team reels it in here and tries to work it up for the score. And you can see the emphasis here is fast break for Carlton. Tori Gray, as soon as that disc was turned over, calling for the disc. Great attempt there, and now going to air it out. No one in the vicinity of Gadu. And that's going to be a score. 13 all. Spike it down. It's a tie game. I'm kind of speechless because that point had so many heart stopping twists and turns, both literally and figuratively. And how about the performance that Anna Gadu has had so far? The 21-year-old junior captain from Seattle, Washington. A great presence with the disc in her hands. And as you see here in this highlight and on that most recent goal, an opportunistic receiver as well. That great bid came up short and that allowed UBC to get that. Those are the calculated risks that you have to keep in mind when you're a defender on the field. If you're going to pull the trigger, you have to understand that if you don't get the block and if you don't slow the receiver down, there's a good chance that receiver is going to have a totally unmarked opportunity while you're on the ground trying to scramble to your feet 
and recover. And in that instance, Nancy Yang is able to step into an inside-out backhand, something that she would not have been able to do if there was a typical traditional mark within her vicinity. I will say what doesn't help the Carlton cause is Gadu was also very open underneath, so it must have been a blown assignment down there, which led to the score. And now UBC putting up a D-line, leap high crossing over from offense. Otherwise, a lot of the D-line players have been getting it done. Moyer had a great first half, been a little bit quieter in terms of defense in the second. So the soft cap went off before this point started. Sorry, as this, as this point started. So we would add one to the highest score after this point ends. So because we're tied 13-13, someone's going to be leading 14-13. We add one to that total. This is a game to 15. What more could you ask for watching some live ultimate here on Ulti World Streams? You got two heavyweights slugging it out. If things go to seed, the winner of this would get first in the pool in that key quarterfinal bye, which you know a lot about, Ian, because you don't want to end up in that pre-quarter where you have to play an extra game on Saturday. They'd be in position to get first in that pool. They both still have a couple more games to win. You know, I just got to give all their other opponents their due respect, right? Yeah, that's true. If, if, if they win the rest of their games, you're right, Ian. Got to make sure. Upsets definitely do happen to have happened already in this championship. But and, and you're right. That buy into the quarterfinals is so huge. Saving yourself from that third round on Saturday. As Carly Campana lays out to save possession for Carlton Syzygy. Chin with a fake gets the around throw off. And it gets blocked, and UBC now with a break opportunity looking for just full on there. unforced error there. Emma Chin and Alyssa Earhart, maybe a touch too casual, and then UBC turns it right back over. Perhaps the nerves in getting to both teams, you think? Nerves, fatigue. I, I haven't seen anything that casual so far in this game. Fishner on the doorstep. And Earhart leaves her defender just a few yards back. And Carlton takes the lead 14-13. Their defensive line a chance to break for the game. There are moments when you just can't turn the disc over. And if you're going to turn the disc over, you can't give your opponent a short field. And just an unforced red zone error from Carlton Syzygy followed by just a gift turnover from British Columbia. Syzygy taking advantage as soon as that disc gets back in their possession. And now, Ian, these are the moments that the big time players come out and we're gonna see who steps out on each line. 14-13 the score here. As Carlton electing not to cross over Campana or Lanier for this point in particular. Also, don't see Tori Gray out on the line there. You can see the Carlton coaching staff, Kisau and Weiss, placing a lot of trust in Syzygy's depth on this D point. Two players clearing out the open side here for UBC. Traditional horizontal stack play as now looking for a reset. Finds oh. Ong under pressure. Hadu open here on this near sideline. Tense moments for both teams. Trying to win this key matchup and that throw too far for Holzman. And Carlton Syzygy 
Here's your chance. Looking deep. Hurtabus made a great effort there. Just a tad too far. UBC another opportunity here, Ian. Well, it's so difficult when you're a, rece you're a receiver and you have to track a disc that's coming in over one shoulder, going over your head, and the flight path is taking it all the way to the other side of your body. Maintaining that balance at high speed, so difficult to do. And then now that British Columbia has the disc, who else is getting it started but Madison Ong with that fantastic inside shot. And now marshalling things at the brick mark. That's going to look for Ong on the reset. Goes inside to Gadu. UBC trying to tie this one up here. Going around, and there it is. It is. UBC gets the score, and we have double game point. Ian, can't ask for more than this. Yes, sir. Grace Dew, the 19-year-old rookie, laying out to secure the game-tying hold. And you can see the body language, the physical cue there from Anna Gadu. That just belies exactly how this British Columbia offense operates. There was no movement at the front of the stack, and Gadu was almost incredulous, like, hey, this is the time we need that cut to initiate to the break side. And with just a little bit of that disc and physical cue, Grace Dew was able to take off, attack that break side space, like you said, Theo, double game point finish on our hands. Denise Su, Emily Chong, Mika Kurahashi back out there for UBC. Andra Moyer, Anna Gadu, Helena Trompley out there as well, trying to get this break. Carlton has Tori Gray out there with the offensive players. Kishner, Chin, Earhart, Campana, Lanier. This is it, folks. Double game point, universe point here from Milwaukee. Campana stretching deep, isolated out of the side stack, marked closely by Moyer. And then Moyer goes step for step, shutting down Campana on the underneath. Around now to Gray. Couple big fakes here, gonna reel it in on this point. Tensions high. As Kishner has it, guarded by Tremblay. Some rounds here for Syzygy. Lefty backhand to Campana. Going around, and there it is! Syzygy takes it on Universe, 15-14. What a game. What a game. Well, as we mentioned earlier, UBC was the team that came out swinging. This was the team that already had a game under its belt that was able to find its form, get a break or two, and start to get control of this game in the first half. But as the game went on, the battle of attrition, Carlton was able to go blow for blow and then punch back even stronger taking its first lead late in the second half, and you saw its stars heavily involved with all of those touches with the game on the line. Kate Lanier, Carly Campana, Tori Gray, exercising patience, breaking the mark, and Carlton holding seed at the moment. That was a big win for them. As we look at the next broadcast, Ian, you'll be on this one as well. Pittsburgh and Sabiner versus Georgia, Georgia, that is going to be a great matchup as well in the men's division. Stay tuned for that 4.30 local time, which is central. So make sure you kind of adjust to wherever time zone you're watching. But Ian, let's put a bow on this game. Final thoughts from you on how both teams performed and just the action that you saw. 
Well, I'm just endlessly impressed with the performance, as you see there, of Carly Campana. You can scout all you want. You know she's going to hurt you. You know you're going to have to factor her in, and she still finds a way to make you pay, no matter what. On the other side of the disc, just a great performance by Anna Gadu. And how about the poise and the field marshalling from Madison Ong? Just playing with composure beyond her years. And Mika Kurahashi as well, just a 19-year-old sophomore, but involved in so much scoring for those happy, cheerful Thunderbirds. Carlton Sissiji will be back in action today at 4.30 against Colorado State. Whereas UBC will take on their matchup at 10.30 tomorrow against UCSD. Thank you for joining us. Want to give a shout out once again to all our production team, everyone in the booth making things look good and sound good. Theo one for Ian Toner. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you for the game at 4.30 between Pittsburgh and Sabanur and Georgia, Georgia.